just wanted, I'm going to turn it over to Bethany for the majority of the content today. I just wanted to remind you all about the benefits that are out there. So hopefully you've checked these off as you've gotten your applications done, or if you've run into um, snags or obstacles, you've come to talk to us so we can help you get over those. But the programs that are out there right now is um, PPP1. If you didn't apply for that originally, you can apply now. If you did like ERTC the first time and need to go back and do that again. You can get uh, PPP1, which is two and a half months of payroll. PPP2 is also open right now um, for two and a half to three and a half months of payroll, depending on what type of business you have. Hospitality businesses get that three and a half months. There's the employee retention tax credit one, which is 50% of salary expense up to $5,000 per employee. That was for um, three quarters in 2020. You could uh, qualify in up to three quarters until you got that $5,000 maximum. Right now there's ERTC2. Uh, that will apply to this quarter and next quarter. That's 70% um, of salary expense up to seven grand per employee per quarter. So that one you could actually get up to 14 grand per employee. And then there's the um, Shuttered Venues Grant, which is a cash grant of 45% of, of, of 2019 annual revenues for um, museums um, and performance venues that were closed. And then uh, if you have or are thinking about getting a loan from the SBA, you can get up to 11 months of principal and interest paid. So those are the program, those are the relief programs out there right now that we know about. And um, Bethany is going to take a, a deeper dive into the Economic Injury Disaster Loan Advance, um, which will not apply to everybody. But for those of you to whom it applies, it's thousands of dollars of a cash grant. So I'm going to turn it over to Bethany. Okay, can you all see my screen? Okay, let me do to the, let me try doing the um, presentation here. Okay, so um, I, a couple things before we dive into it. First of all, our presentation is short today. Um, and what we wanna do at the end is hear from y'all because um, I know some of you have gotten the invite to apply for this and just to hear about your luck and, and or misfortune getting through these processes, but that is particularly critical with the economic injury disaster loan, because as most of y'all know, as opposed to the PPP, where luckily we the, the um, lenders are diversified and it's easier to talk to human being and get information about where you stand in the process with idle, it's very frustrating, unfortunately, because the customer service is poor, the system is quite overwhelmed, and there's not a lot of communication. So a lot of times we don't know where we stand and it takes sort of all of us talking together through this process and we kind of triage it at Newtown with the information that you give us to be able to help guide you and other folks successfully through this. Um, so just wanna say that at the end, what we'd like to do is hear a little more from you. I'm just gonna give you guys an overview of how it's supposed to work in theory and then we can talk about how it's working in practice at the end. So we've talked about this briefly. Um, this is a, a new component of the second round of, of relief. It's called the targeted advance. This is going to be relevant to those of you who only got what they're calling a partial advance. So as you know, they ran out of money for this. And so what they did in the first round is they only gave you $1,000 per employee. So if you did not get a full $10,000 with your first round of the Economic Injury Disaster Loan Advance, which works as a grant, and you can get that even if you did not qualify for a loan. So if you did not get that full $10,000, you are going to qualify um, to apply for a targeted advance. The three things that they're looking for is that your business is located in a low income community. I'm gonna show you a map in a second. And based on who I see on this call, that should apply to absolutely everybody here. Um, you're gonna to have to demonstrate that you suffered economic loss greater than 30% from 2019 to 2020, starting on March the 2nd, okay? And you gotta use an eight week period to show that you had at least 30% loss in sales in 2020 compared to 2019. This is going to be the most difficult piece of the process, and you're going to need your financials to demonstrate that. And then you're going to, you have to have 300 or less employees. So um, let me 
I did that in the reverse order. So um, some of you know, I have a PhD in cultural geography and I know Josh likes to geek, geek out on maps too. Um, and in fact, I can even show you if I do this real quick, you can see it easier here. So this whole section in dark purple it, are census tracts that have at least 20% or lower as far as folks living below the poverty line, which is defined as a low income uh, community per the IRS and per the SBA as they're defining it now. So there was some confusion about how that's gonna be defined, but we've seen some official communication from the SBA that they're using the IRS code 45DE. So, um, and we'll share, of course, these things with you if you wanna look up your address in particular. Um, but you can see all of downtown really qualifies as a low income community per this definition. Um, let me go back to pre present. Okay, so that's that piece. But for all of you now, technically, the way they're um, saying that they're going to determine once you present all your information, if you're in a low income community that they're sending invites out to everyone who just got a partial advance. Um, but you, everybody here on this phone call should meet that, that piece. So the second piece that's going to be the harder piece and, and the, the onus is going to be on you is you're going to have to demonstrate that 30% loss. So the IRS tells you, you, you need to have your 2019, not the IRS, the SBA tells you, you need to have your 2019 business tax returns to complete the application for the advance. It is going to be exceptionally helpful for you to have 2020 financials. Ideally, you've got uh, an income profit and loss statement that shows your total sales, not just for the year, but by the month, and also your cost of goods sold. But if you've got a good point of sale system, you can probably do a really good job. You'll be able to definitely show more or less your total income sales. Um, you can see your total sales. And then most of you probably have some system for keeping track of your inventory purchases, right? But you're going to have to be able to show your total monthly gross receipts from January 2019 to this current month in 2021. So that's a good bit of financial data there, right? And remember, gross receipts. And you may remember they specifically asked this the first time you applied for it, but it was on an annual basis. And they, the only specific financial numbers they asked for was your total income and your total cost of goods sold. So th this is an invitation only application process. So we know the emails have been sent and they are currently being sent to everyone who got actually got an advance. And again, a partial advance. So if you got the full $10,000, that's you've maxed out. So they're not going to send you an email and invite you to apply. Some of, some of you, I don't know if it's anybody on our call right now, but if you're talking to your fellow business owners, nonprofit owners, if you apply, but you were later in that pipeline and you got denied the advance because they ran out of money, unfortunately, you're in the second wave of applicants that they're going to notify and that we know that that has not started yet. There's some confusion over when they, the folks that didn't get money the first time, if they're just going to get the thousand dollars per employee, or if you're going to be eligible right away to apply for the full 10,000. But we, we think you'll be eligible for the full 10,000 at that time. And they're going to use the same targeted kind of um, parameters that they're using for the folks who got the partial advance in the first round. So hopefully everybody here on the call has gotten those emails. We'll talk about what you do if you haven't, um, and, and we'll just let you share your stories about that specifically in a few minutes. Um, just beware that, you know, apparently a couple people have been concerned and gotten some funky communication, and there probably are some real jerks out there who realize that the SBA is asking for this personal information right now or these business financials. So just make sure that if you get an email like that, that it's coming from an sba.gov email and that it appears to be legitimately connected to your SBA portal account. Um, and, and just be aware that what, so you're gonna do the sales information. That's gonna be the key thing that you're gonna present. They're apparently gonna just also confirm that what you presented in your initial application about your 2019 numbers is correct. And what's critical here is then they're gonna ask you to submit this IRS form and they are going to request your 2019 tax records directly from the IRS. 
And so this is different. They didn't really do any kind of verification last time. They, they took everybody at their word, but this time they are going to have you fill this form out and they are gonna get your tra tax records directly from the IRS. So you do not want the numbers that you submit during this application request to be different than what your tax returns show, because if you do, you're gonna be out. And, and they specifically now are being uh, explicit about this because there is no appeal process. So if your records don't agree and confirm, you're gonna be out of the loop. And so you absolutely wanna make sure that anything you put down for 2019, now 2020, as far as we know, they're not gonna have a way to really check that. You know, They're gonna ask you in good faith and have you sign that you've submitted these numbers to the best of your ability and that they're accurate and so forth, but they, can't, they are gonna double check you on 2019. And you want to just be diligent all across the board with everything um, and that everything is correct and that you are consistent. And where we've seen this issue, even with folks who are supposed to get um, the loan and not the advance, is that there are real issues around your bank account, the business name that you've maybe used to apply for the grant, I mean, the, the grant or the loan, and your business name on your tax returns. And if you have any variability across that, you might get, you might be out of luck. Okay. Apparently they also had a lot of issues the first round with folks that submitted bank account information routing number to accounts that cannot be used for ACH deposits. And if that happened, you were just out of luck. Um, and again, you really want to make sure that you've got all this account information matching up. We know for a fact uh, an issue someone's run, through, run into with this, and they've not been able to claim their loan that they could really, really use right now in the winter of 2021. All right, so it's in your best interest to make sure everything's absolutely correct from start to finish. Okay, so just to be sure, and we'll talk about this as a group, but if you think you should have received an email by now and you haven't, please check your junk email. And some folks I know have like four or five different accounts. So just be sure, like if you get emails forwarded and all that, that you're looking in all the right places. I know it sounds stupid, but the invite could be there waiting on you. Um, so you wanna make sure you check all that. Then, and I'm gonna share all this contact information at the end. Then we encourage you to go through the SBA customer service line. Uh, I know it's annoying. I know the service is poor but you're gonna to need to be able to say that you've done that because if you get really stuck, then the next thing we know to ask you to do is to contact the Macon SBDC office. And what they do right now, their process is they essentially create a, a client file and where needed, they get you connected to the state SBA office. But before they do that, they're gonna ask if you have reached out directly to the SBA and their generic customer service line. So, if you are getting left out of the loop of this process, I'm really sorry. You're gonna just have to really be diligent. I know uh, Scott Mitchell has some war stories about that, but if you hang in there, you can do it, but you, you've got to be diligent and you're gonna be put on hold. And I remember there was a really funny Saturday night live said about, skit about calling customer service lines, right? And just getting in your Zen yoga mood before you call them. But you, you, you got to do that here because um, it's going to take some diligence if you have been overlooked on that email and that invite. Um, and just to know in the rare event that you or any of your fellow nonprofit business owners, entrepreneurs, if you have not applied for the loan itself, they're still taking applications through the end of this year. The good thing is, especially Caitlin, as for instance, I don't know if this applies to you, but for some folks that we didn't know if you could apply based on when your business opened, and now we're getting some information that if you had a tax EIN and you can show some big business activity prior to February 15th, um, that you probably can't apply. And now they're asking for 2020 financials and not 2019. So that's good because you can show more impact to your total gross receipts than you could have if all you had was 2019 numbers, because essentially they'd say you cannot uh, show any economic damage. So if you have not applied or you know someone who hasn't, especially if they didn't get open till right around the time of the pandemic, you may be in luck here to get this really great loan, which we talked about several times, is incredibly long-term and really low interest rate. And if you don't know if you need it or not, you can hold it in suspense. But our experience has been a few folks who declined it earlier in 20, 
20 are very sorry that they did. And so um, please move forward with that if you haven't. Um, and, and I think most of you know this, but do not apply again if you've applied for the loan um, because you, that, again, the crossed wires and the SBA system, they cannot handle it. And they, they explicitly, explicitly say time and time again, do not reapply. Try to take the exact same steps we talked about where you go through the generic line and if they cannot be helped, which usually they are not, then you need to contact make an SBDC and have them create a client file for you. Now, if you were denied, and I know in one instance of a making business who thinks the sales numbers that they use at their loan award was too small. So they have appealed the SBA's decision. Um, and there is, this is the number of the email address that you use. It's the office in, in Fort Worth, Texas. Granted, they may not be answering their emails this week, but um, that's the office that takes the, um, the appeals. Okay, and you should include your application number, any, if they specifically request documentation, you should do that and anything you can include to help overcome their reason for saying they've declined you in that initial email will help you out. So just be sure if you or any of your colleagues haven't really fully explored the actual loan itself, we encourage you to still do that and try to take advantage of that program. Yeah, and then let me stop my share, Josh. I hate to shift gears so dramatically, but but let me, I only have three slides. So let, let me do mine and then we'll start doing questions. Um, so the, the, the only things I wanted to mention to you are, are um, they're not huge, but they may have significant impacts on, on some of you. So basically regarding the um, uh, employee retention tax credit. We talked about the qualifications that you're a business or a nonprofit non or for profit, and you got to meet one of these other two qualifications. Your revenues dropped in a calendar quarter by 50% when you're looking at 2020 to 2019, or you were partially or fully ordered to close. All right, so I just got some clarifications about that. Um, the, the partially or fully ordered to close includes any government mandate that impairs your ability to do business. So where this has come up and has been significant is for, for instance, restaurants. So if you own a restaurant and the governor's orders, even to this day, limit the amount of seating that you're able to um, provide for your patrons, that counts as partial closure. If you are a furniture retailer who has been forced to reduce the number of patrons who can be in your showroom at any given time, that counts as a partial closure. So I, those have come up with a couple of, of key businesses um, who've talked to me because maybe your, um, your revenues were not low. Your revenues are still doing pretty well. You're not, you don't meet that 50% drop. That's fine. If you still were, if your business was impaired in any way that, um, that, that could have limited your revenue, then you, you qualify under this partial closure. And you qualify for that partial closure during any calendar quarter where you were required to partially close. Um, so that's significant for some of you. Now, for some like, where like Newtown, where we only have 10 people, everybody's got their own individual office, you know, there's really no partial closure um, that impacts us. We would have to qualify under the revenue decline. So let me tell you one more thing about that revenue decline. Um, when we talked about this last time, I told you that you had to um, you had to have a calendar quarter where your revenues were 50% lower in 2020 versus 2019. That is still true. Um, you have to meet that test in a calendar quarter to qualify. But what I want to clarify is you continue to qualify in every subsequent quarter until your revenues exceed 80% of the prior year quarter. All right, so I, I know this is real tricky. David's smiling because he's the one that found this and, and helped me um, figure it out. But it could be really significant because remember this is a $5,000 maximum benefit in 2020 per employee. And so for those of you who do qualify based on the revenue um, decline, this could let you continue to qualify into subsequent quarters where you didn't have the 50% revenue decline, but you had not yet reached more than 80% of your previous revenue. So um, again, these are some, these don't apply to everybody, 
But for those of you to whom they do apply, it could be thousands of extra dollars. So I just wanted to make sure that we got those two qualifications, those two clarifications out there. The number one partial closure that impacted the capacity of your business qualifies you for the ERTC in every calendar quarter where you were subject to that partial closure. Okay, so that's, that's number one. And number two, if you meet the revenue decline in any quarter to qualify, you will continue to qualify in every quarter after that until your revenues um, surpass 80% of your previous revenues from 2020 to 2019. I'm happy to talk about talk with any of you individually if you have additional questions about those items, but I just wanted to throw those two clarifications out there that may help you um, get a little more benefit out of the ERTC program. I'm going to... And I'm going to just put that the final slide up just because it's got some contact information to share with folks. Uh -oh. I thought it was just the very next one. Hang on a second. Um, but I just want you guys to specifically see, first of all, we have an old link. Um, but it's it's a step by step walkthrough through the loan and advance application. I think everybody here has applied, um, although maybe not some of you for your second and third businesses. Um, and you may have some friends who want to. And also um, it's got the SBA and the SBDC contact info. So I just want to try to find it here and pull it up, pull it up for you all. I'm not sure why I can't get out of. There we go. There it is. Okay. I'm just going to recap um, some of the questions that came up in chat too. I replied in chat, but for, um, for everybody's sake, or if people are on their phone and can't see the chat, we got a question about whether you could apply for PPP2 before you've been granted forgiveness on PPP1. And yes, you can. The standard to apply for PPP2 is you have to certify that you will have PPP1 expended before you get PPP2. So you can apply for PPP2 even if you haven't finished spending PPP1, much less been granted forgiveness. You just have to have it spent before you actually draw down the money from PPP2. Um, and then uh, the, the next question was about the whether it was going to be limited by employees or whether you get the full advance. Our understanding right now is that you're going to get the difference between whatever you got last time and 10 grand, that you will end up with 10 grand as your advance uh, as a free grant from this program. Um, and then uh, Julie asked whether you could, uh, whether it mattered if you took the loan or didn't take the loan, doesn't matter at all. The advance is totally separate. So if you took your EID loan before but got less than 10 grand in advance, you can still get the rest of your advance. And if you denied your EID loan um, but got the advance, you can still get the rest of your advance. So you can get the rest of your advance no matter what you did with the loan. Although like Bethany said, and like I will advise every single one of you, if you are if you have not taken a loan, I believe you should. I have not found an exception to that rule yet. I think that gets us through the questions. Yeah, and I guess one thing that we're a little unsure of, but our understanding is that um, because we do know some, folks did get the advance, but maybe were denied a loan. Um, but our understanding is they're still eligible for the targeted advance. I don't know that we have anybody on the call to confirm, but Scott, I know for sure, and maybe some some other folks here, but you've you've already received the e email invite and have initiated your targeted advance application. Do you have any insights from doing that? Um, yeah, I will say um, that you you must have what it what they're going to send you is a, a link to a spreadsheet that you have to fill in and what it has on it it has 2019 at the top and then it has January through December and each month you have to put what your gross receipts were for 2019 then it has the same column for 2020 then it has a column for 2021 and you and then and then at the bottom it just asked you to certify that these are true and you you hit submit and that was it it took about 15 minutes to complete. Cool. So the hard part's just having access to that revenue data. If you know yeah. what your revenues are, if you've got point of sale system that can give it to you or QuickBooks Online or an accountant who keeps things up to date for you, as long as you've got those revenue numbers in front of you, it's a really quick application. Yeah, I think it's very easy. So 
you're sending in all your, you're not going to pick, like with PPP, I could pick which quarter I wanted to use. But with this, they're going to just look at it and see if there's an eight-week period. Okay. And then one other question. Um, so for nonprofits, for the PPP2, I had to use all income. And I'm assuming this is the same way. I mean, re restricted grants and everything had to be in there. So yeah. I'm just going to list. Uh, then that's, that, uh, I mean, it, well. It, it does, but I'll nice. tell you what. Our work, we must have gotten a big grant that I, I I should go back and see what it is in January. It works both ways in January of 2019. So first quarter 2020 was actually the worst quarter. It was completely yeah. unpandemic related. But, Good. You know. Yeah. I mean, ours was too. It's yeah. Same. yeah. For nonprofits, when you're looking at total revenues, that doesn't really have any relationship to your ability to operate or not. But Right. Especially if a lot of it's restricted grants. But anyway, that worked. So I could, so there is probably, and, yeah. and third quarter was not great, which really was pandemic related, but also I hadn't gotten an email. Um, those were my other, those were my three questions, all income. And then um, they're going to pick the eight week period. I put the email address that these uh, application solicitations are coming from. Yeah, so I searched I, I, and I went and searched. <laughs> um, <laughs> I don't think I would have trashed it, but I searched my trash too. Okay. And maybe they're not all out yet. We were, we got the advance pretty quickly, but we, it took a long time to get the loan. Yeah. Um, and, and, I, and I'm going to say this Supposedly still to coming out too. for the SBA. They're and still coming out to me. The EIDL loan, if people hadn't done in our experience. So because we're a nonprofit, we were approved initially for $150,000 and our board was a little, um, Nervous about that, um, committing future boards to 30 years of $600 a month payments. So we requested a lesser amount, which kicked us to the back of the line, which nobody told us. But they did come back. I mean, we got the money in December, but we didn't get 150. We got 50,000. We asked for 100. So we were approved 150. We asked for 100. We ended up getting 50,000. I don't know if they ran out of money or what, but at the end of the day, we could have turned around, we could have taken the 150 and turned around and paid $50,000 on the loan that day. Yes, right. So take everything yeah. you get when you get it. Thank you, Julie. You're welcome. That's exactly what I think too is, yeah. God, and I mean, these government programs, they're just not, I mean, you just said several ways they don't work real smoothly. So you'd rather put yourself in the driver's seat and have yes. some cash in your pocket to be able to do what you need. And we don't know that these EIDL loans up to a certain amount aren't going to be forgiven as well. Yeah, that's true. Still so possible. you may as well take it. Yeah. And Julie, Scott was like very first in line on the idle process period. Mm -hmm. um, we, we just know he happened to click when they did the whole new thing. So, and, and the only other person I know for sure that's gotten one was applied that first day as well. Got the, the email. And the SBA has confirmed that they are still sending out the email invites. So. I will also say, though, because we requested enough, I have an e, uh, SBA person assigned to me um, that I communicated with about my loan and all of that, too. That's a, some kind of advocate person. Um, so that's kind of nice, too. I don't know if anybody who's that advance was all just kind of it appeared in the checking account. But if you've gotten a loan, I, I think you should have a, a person um, May, anyway, I do. It may be because we were so much trouble. Um, but I'll one. keep waiting on the email. I have one too, Julie, but I have one because I had to go through an appeals process. I think once you do an appeals process, they assign you somebody would be my okay. guess. Yeah. Any other questions out there? So the bottom line, I think, is to continue monitoring every email you possibly could have shared with the SBA for a, for an email from that um, account targeted advance at sba.gov and then be prepared to fill out the information in the way that Bethany described and let us know if you have any trouble. Um, yeah, and we should say that it's limited funds. So uh, we encourage you to apply as soon as you do get the email invite. Um, 
there is concern that they're going to run out of those monies like they did the first time. Right. And like Scott was saying, the best way to be prepared to do that in the first 15 minutes after you get the email is to have your revenues uh, laid out 19, 20, 21. Can I ask a question about ERTC? Sure. Um, so I was talking to my accountant and she was saying that um, because I did not have any um, employees in second and third quarter last year, because I had to lay all my employees off, and I can't count myself as paying myself, that I'm not eligible for ERTC. Is that correct? Do you know? Yeah, I'm just, I was thinking for a minute. Yeah, so the way you get the EIDL is crediting against your payroll tax, and it's refundable but you still have to have had the payroll tax. So I think if you had no one on payroll during that time period when you were eligible, that's correct, that there's no way for you to claim the ERTC. Okay, uh, thank you. You can't claim it against wages that weren't paid. Hey, Josh, this is Larry Bush. Are, are hey. you gonna cover the uh, ERTC2 today at all? Yeah, well, I, I, I had a slide in there about ERTC2, and um, Bethany, if you'll just flip back one, I think, one or two slides, that'd be great. So, yeah, yeah, that's, no, no, one more forward. I just don't want to share my screen again. What a hassle. No, keep going. <laughs> nope, that's the wrong way. It's the next to the last slide in the whole deck. There you go. So the ERTC2 um, has different qualifications. It's triggered by 20% uh, decline in revenues. That's, that's it, that's the only trigger. Um, so this is very different from ERTC1. So you have to have had a 20% decline in revenues in one or both of the first two quarters of 2021 compared to 2019. I know this gets so freaking confusing because we're comparing different periods and we have different standards for comparison. So obviously the first quarter of uh, 2021 has not closed yet. So we're looking at the time period that is um, January, February, and March of 2021. So what we're gonna watch for is you need to be tracking your revenues during the current quarter. Because the last thing you wanna do is close out business on the last day of March. And it turns out that you had revenue of 19, that was 19% down and doesn't qualify you for the ERTC during the quarter. When if you just delayed a couple of invoices till the next morning, you would have been there. So my advice for this is to be tracking your revenues during these first two quarters. Um, because if you're not close to the 20% decline, then you're not gonna qualify and it doesn't really matter. So, so what you're watching for is just to see how close your revenues are um, down uh, comparing this quarter to the first quarter of um, uh, 2019. Um, and so if you qualify, if you have that 20% decline, then it works the pre pretty similarly to the way ERTC1 does, except you get a higher percentage paid. ERTC1 is 50%, this one's 70%. Um, and, and so you can get a, a, you know up to seven grand per quarter per employee. Um, uh, up to an unlimited total, and that works for both quarters. Does that help? Do you have any other specific questions? No, that's good, Josh. I, I just wasn't real familiar with uh, how it's going to work. Yeah, it was uh, real complicated to keep straight. But but I think this one is. I mean, there's there's not a whole lot in your control about it. So so it's just keeping track of the revenues as you get towards the end of March and thinking about if there are strategies that are going to keep you eligible or kick you out. It's it's really just going to be if you're on the bubble, um, which I know several people are, and 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 so you have some control and discretion over making sure that you close that quarter in an eligible fashion. So when it says that you can't use um, this. ERTC2 for the same wages as PPP2. Um, are, are we talking about like, for example, if I if I'm getting ERTC2 based on uh, the first quarter and I'm using PPP2 in the second quarter, then is my ERTC2 going retroactively to the first quarter, or am I in their eyes spending it in the second quarter because that's when I received it? That's a really good question. 
my understanding so far has not been, I don't think they care about when you receive the money. I think it's about when you're claiming to have uh, earned it. So I, I think, and, and James, jump in if, or David, if, if, if you have any different opinion, but, but I, I think you don't want to claim the ERTC against wages that were being paid with the PPP that you had in hand that you indicated on your forgiveness. So the best case scenario for anybody right now is if you not filed forgiveness for any of your PPPs because you've got some discretion still over when you say you're spending that. The problem is you're going to apply for the ERTC in the quarter that you qualify for the ERTC. Um, but what they don't want is you claiming the ERTC for 50% of wages that were actually already paid with proceeds from PPP as was indicated in your forgiveness. Okay, so that really would make care. sense. Good, that helps. Yeah. So, and, and we talked about a number of strategies to make that happen. Um, Larry Bush came up with a great one, which is, you know, only 60% of your PPP has to go towards wages. So that leaves you 40% that still could be covered by ERTC. ERTC covers 50%. So, you know, there's a, you know, you could qualify in the same quarters by lining those two things up. Um, you just would want to make sure that they do line up. And the safest thing to do is to just do them in different quarters entirely, if that's possible. It's just not possible for everybody. Um, so, uh, Josh, this is Dot. Hey. If, again, if you are the only employee, then this does not apply to you at all, right? That's right. Like, like, um, like uh, Scott was saying, you have to have um, wages that you're paying payroll taxes on. So, you know, okay. it's possible for a single employee to be doing that, but most aren't. So, um, so it doesn't apply if you're a, 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 a sole practitioner, a sole proprietor, and you're just paying taxes on your personal taxes. Okay, thank you. And Julie, yes, you're right. You should go ahead and have your total income laid out from January 2019 to present. That's what you need to be able to fill out the, um, the, uh, to get your advance rounded up. So that is definitely what you can go ahead and do now is go ahead and have that laid out January, February, all the way to today. And, and then like Scott was saying, it only takes about 15 minutes to fill in the application if you've got that on hand. And you don't want major discrepancies in what you submit on that spreadsheet for 2019 versus your tax exactly. returns. Right. So I maybe, mean, you don't. That's yeah. the one thing that they're going to cross check you on. Yes. And so my, I think the tax return we just did would be 2019. Yeah. Because our fiscal year is July to June. Should be right. CPA was all in there. Any other questions, comments, or? Well, great. I, I hope this helped and, and we'll be around. Now Bethany's expert on the advance roundup. So you just let us know if you need help and we'll be happy to do whatever we can. Yeah. And keep us posted. You know, as we've said, I mean, if you let us know that you've gotten it or you still haven't or what, I mean, again, it makes it easier for us. We kind of have to do a little bit of deferring here to figure out how this process is working just so we can maximize the system for all of you. Um, because we know even, you know, a few extra thousand dollars right now that you don't have to pay back will be great to get you to sunnier weather and more, more feet on the street and all that good stuff. So um, any information you can share will help us help all of you. Hope y'all have a happy weekend and good rest happy of the Friday. Friday. <laughs> Bye y'all. Bye. Thank you all.